Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. We hope that you and your loved ones are doing well and safe. My name is Rashmi Mutt, and I'm a consultant with Zinov's Conex practice. For those of you whom we haven't had the pleasure of interacting with so far, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce Zinov before kickstarting today's session. Zinov is an 18-year-old global strategy and management consulting firm with a core focus on product engineering and digital transformation. Back in the day, Zinov's primary focus was to help global companies set up a footprint in India by setting up global in-house centers. Over time, the company has evolved to enable globalization in a much larger way. We have offices across Bangalore, Delhi, Seattle, and so on. GAP, or the Global Center of Excellence Accelerator Platform, is a practice within Zinov. As part of this practice, we focus specifically on how global R&D centers can drive maximum value from India. As of today, around 200 plus companies are part of Zinov's GAP platform. A great way to drive value is through innovation, and today's webinar is brought to you by GAP's innovation practice, Conext. At Conext, our focus is to help organizations build their innovation capabilities, both external and internal. On the external side, we have organizations with their startup collaboration programs and academic partnerships. On the internal side, we help individuals within large corporates to drive innovation with the mindset of an entrepreneur. Conex has hands-on experience with corporates, industry bodies, and cross-border government institutions. The logos that you can see on the slide, if Prashant could move to the next slide, thanks, have put faith in our abilities and execution, enabling us to learn what works on the ground and what can be applied in the market. There's no denying that innovation is key to creating value for a business. And with this in mind, many GCOEs have been investing in innovation programs as a way of contributing value to the company at large. With the quality of engineering talent working in GCOEs and their understanding of business and related processes, employee-led innovation has become the most prioritized innovation strategy. While the overarching goals and strategy for a GCOE are identified, not all centers are able to effectively deliver business value through their innovation programs. And as a result of this, most centers are unable to establish themselves as innovation hubs for the global company. Today's session will bring forth Zinov's point of view as well as the point of view of someone familiar and experienced within the ecosystem of innovation to address some of the prominent questions that GCOEs have in this quest. As established in the beginning, the innovation quotient of a center is a testament of its vitality. Today, we'll be exploring the path to that vitality. I'd like to quickly run through the agenda of today's session. But right after this, we'll run into the welcome note and context setting by my colleague Atit Danak, the principal and head of Conex practice. After that, we'll hear the Zinov's point of view on the path to innovation vitality conducted by my colleague Divya Jagasya. After that, we'll be experiencing a fireside chat on the inception to implementation, where we'll be hosting Venkat S. Raju, an advisor to Zinov, moderated by myself. Right after this, we have a segment that we titled the Open Discussion and Q&A, where we'll be addressing some of your audience questions. So please do go ahead and enter your questions into the Q&A or the chat tab on Zoom. And we'll finally be closing the session with the closing note by Atit once again. We'll also be running poll questions throughout the, throughout the duration of the webinar. So please ensure that you participate. It always helps for us to understand the perspective of the ecosystem as well. I would now like to call upon my colleague, Atit, to deliver the welcome note. Thanks a lot, Rashmi. Um, Prashant, am I audible? Yes, good to go. Excellent. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and a very good morning. Uh, Innovation is a topic that you know all of us discuss and talk about more often than not. We speak about great place to innovate. We speak about culture of innovation. 
um, and everything in and around it. That being said, the question finally comes out is how do you really become a great place to innovate? How do you truly have a culture of innovation? As we speak and have been speaking to different uh, corporate leaders, to employees, uh, to entrepreneurs outside a large corporates, what we have realized is that fundamentally there is a need to ask the right questions. And the need to ask the right questions is because we found something very distinct when people you know, responded to some a question like what is innovation versus what is invention. When we asked them that what do you think you know, is innovation in terms of importance to your company versus you know, how satisfied are you with your processes and your outputs and your outcomes today. We saw a lot of differences in terms of opinions. We saw a lot of ironic situations where something was really important, but people were still not satisfied, where something as simple as innovation versus invention definition was not really clear for people. And with that perspective, what we did at Zinov is that we started to say that the first thing we need to do is to ask the right questions. If we ask the right questions, then it's only when we can get the right answers. Through that journey of last couple of months in terms of talking to different leaders, we came out with the perspective in terms of the need to fundamentally change the language of how we think about innovation itself. That language is critical is because it allows us to have a common perspective in terms of how do we discuss about innovation and hence how do we solve for different problems and challenges which are there. My colleague today, Divya Chigasia, who will be coming on soon, will be giving you a perspective in terms of how to think about innovation and from there on how to ask the right questions from your company's perspective so that we are able to accurately identify the gaps and the challenges that we have and hence are able to solve for those particular problem statements. Our perspective as of now is this, that the odds of success of an entrepreneur are lower than an entrepreneur. But why is that? And how do you really solve for it? And for that, I would welcome Divya to come online and share her perspective and the presentation with us today. And from then on, we get into the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Atit, for uh, the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I am Divya Jagasia, and I'm part of the Conex team. My focus at Conext is to work with organizations that want to build their internal innovation capabilities. And I'd like to thank all of you for showing interest in this topic and joining us this morning. To start off, I'd like to call out three things that most of us attending this webinar already know. The first is that innovation is not an option and it is needed for our company's survival and growth. Second is that when we say innovation, we mean the company's ability to adapt to change, the changing environment, including the customer preferences, the technology, the competition that is traditional as well as a new competition from startups. But most of, importantly, and something that's not on this slide, but again, what we all know is the third thing, which is that it is extremely difficult to respond to change and keep up with it. And it is difficult for every company and every team, irrespective of its size, its location, or its construct to actually figure out how to respond to this change. Now, looking at the companies that have been able to respond to change better than some others, we know that they end up becoming the most innovative and also the fastest growing companies. When we look at these companies, we realize that their approach to innovation has been very holistic. They are able to drive incremental improvements and sustain their products as well as disrupt the market with breakthrough innovation. If we look at the example of uh, Apple, and if we trace their growth across the years, we can see that it is a good mix of breakthrough innovation as well as incremental and transformative innovation. So if you look at the iPod, iTunes, uh, and the iPhone, that's something that clearly disrupted the market, disrupted the competition. Whereas if you look at them in current times, a lot of their focus is really around sustaining uh, these products and uh, bringing in a lot of incremental improvements with the phone, the battery, the display, and so on and so forth. However, 
barring these few companies why is it that so many other organizations find it hard to innovate and their innovation efforts are not exactly satisfactory here are some of the common reasons for this that we have experienced and discussed with most of the organizations that we work with first is that when we see we see a lot of companies having trouble understanding which area and what exactly in innovation do they really want to focus on second is that if the team has identified some of these areas there is no actual alignment to pursue it so just to take an example of something as simple as a hackathon there could be a lot of non alignment and very nominal buy in around the themes of a hackathon and what this does is that it eventually translates into not knowing which ideas to nurture and how to build uh, a real innovation pipeline and we see a lot and if at all companies also are able to identify which ideas to work on we see them not having sufficient or the right capabilities of resources to actually take these promising ideas further and lastly there could be slow or unsure decision making that we've seen now flipping uh the sides and looking at innovation from an individual's perspective uh and building on to what atit mentioned in the beginning as well we've seen that individuals who try to innovate outside of a corporate construct that is as an entrepreneur have better chances of taking an idea forward be it because of the focus that they're able to get the change in the mindset that they feel that they're owning the idea or the support in the ecosystem outside uh they're able to do it much better only very few individuals in a few corporates are able to um you know take these ideas forward with the right focus and the right mindset and when we try to really investigate and look at what is it that is in the system that is helping um people outside the organization innovate better than inside a corporate we plotted the entrepreneurship ecosystem onto the innovation journey and what we saw is that an individual can get the requisite support for the idea right from its inception to scale be it from incubators from angels vcs uh, or even family but when we plotted the corporate ecosystem across the innovation journey we found severe gaps in the ecosystem we see that most companies do not design their programs keeping in mind the entire innovation life cycle and usually it is only a part of the life cycle that is taken into consideration and in most cases and something that we've observed is that the focus is really on ideation hence corporates need to start thinking about innovation as a journey that is linked to their innovation goals The slide that you see on your screen represents a five stage journey some uh, and most of you might be familiar with uh, this journey or versions of it but um and different people use different terminologies but the point is that when we talk about the innovation journey these are five broad stages that we really need to focus on the first stage is ex exploration where we're really looking at the innovation hypothesis we are validating that this is um you know the right area to work on getting the kind of alignment to pursue it what we've seen is that most organizations either skip this step or don't do it well enough the second is really the ideation phase this is something that we see a lot uh where we're actually trying to generate and uh, validate ideas and concepts the third is the problem solution fit stage this is where one has to start building out a solution a lot of times we're looking at building out the minimum viable product where the hypothesis is tested in the real world environment uh we're also looking at getting our first set of users or customers at uh, this stage the next is really the product market fit which is about getting a larger base of users or customers and the last is where we're trying to scale or grow grow the uh, innovation 
Now, when we talk about connecting this entire innovation journey to the goals, we see that the innovation goals can broadly be bucketed into current and future, which is basically uh, the incremental, transformative, and breakthrough innovation. And basis that there could be some adjustments that this same journey could require. So to give an example, if you look at the ideation phase, we know that employees will naturally come up with a lot of incremental improvements. But if our strategy is really to drive breakthrough innovation, then we need to look at ideation a little differently so that the ideas coming out are really uh, high impact and big ideas. Now, what this approach does is that it really simplifies innovation for both the corporate or anyone in, in um, orchestrating the innovation journey within a corporate as well as an employee participating. So the company ex understands exactly what kind of resources need to be deployed in which programs at which stage. And the employees know very clearly and concretely what is it that they need to achieve at each stage and through each program. Nothing more, nothing less. So um, in fact, uh, in organizations who have done it well, we see that employees themselves are able to call out that the idea is not ready to go to the next stage. And that's a great example of the clarity this kind of approach can bring into innovation on ground. Now, really talking about on ground, let's see how is it that we can um, transition this entire thing into uh, our approach on ground. And hence, in this section, I will be walking us through an internal innovation framework that Zinov has built. And I'll also highlight a few uh, key insights on the framework. And of course, I'd also like to call out that Based on the role that Zinov has played in the GCOE ecosystem, the framework has a very strong consideration for driving innovation precisely from the GCOE construct. So uh, starting off, as we studied the innovation capability across GCOEs, we could bucket it into four stages of maturity. The first stage is what we call innovation as a concept. This is where the seed of innovation is really incepted in the GCOE. And we see a few people experimenting with innovation at the center. This is where the center could simply be running one or two innovation events in the year. At stage two, what we call innovation as an activity, this is where the center has realized that their employees can be innovative and this can be good for the business as well. So they start committing to one or two programs that they want to drive from the center. At stage three, what happens uh, is what we call innovation as a process. This is where the center's view changes from independent programs to actually creating a, uh, an entire pipeline of innovation. And this is where innovation processes come into place. And that really becomes the fundamental basis uh, across all programs. At stage four, which is what we call innovation as a culture, these processes become so strong and we know they work and even employees know how they work and how to work them. And this is where the employee contribution can really be accelerated as a result of which the innovation portfolio at the center is very robust. So diving a little deeper into the highest stage of maturity, that is innovation as a culture. Let's try and understand what really happens as the center moves towards this stage. A few things happen. One is that um, the process becomes very, very evident. So everyone knows right from an employee to the top level, what is their role and how to play the role. People understand that innovation is not just about invention or ideation or creating assets. It is really about uh, taking these ideas to deployment and creating value for the business. They understand commercialization and monetization of in innovation. And that's where uh, the focus starts um, to lie. And hence, if we look at the illustration, we see that 
from year one to year three, the quality and the conversion and the potential impact of the innovations of the projects that are coming out of the center seriously improve. Yes, as a result of um, this change in the pipeline, there are there are two very, very important things that start happening. One is that the GCOE becomes a center of strategic importance to the business. The GCOE does not only contribute to the business's cost agenda, but also the value agenda. Employees and teams start having a chance to accelerate their careers. And because of this, the GCOE becomes very aspirational to talent. It starts being called uh, a very innovative workplace. Next, if we look at it from uh, the point of view of a global business, uh, the, they see the GCOE's contribution is now also towards profitability, improving customer experience, revenue, taking innovations with speed to the market. Now, only a few GCOEs are at this stage or close to this stage. And one example is a global automotive company where the India Center is a hub for AI and new technology. Uh, and the, the company is using the expertise to have very specific innovation in adjacent spaces uh, driven from this center. And they're very focused on both global markets as well as the APAC market. Now, moving on to actually looking inside our centers. So how is it that we can understand where we are and how, how mature our capabilities are? So we've identified four pillars that are part of our framework that can help you assess this. Broadly, these, these pillars are the strategic intent, the process, enablers, and metrics for innovation. And I will be taking you through each of these pillars in a little more detail. So under strategic intent, one needs to assess the innovation charter's alignment to business priorities and the HQ commitment uh, to this innovation agenda. So one can look at the type of innovation driven from the center. So if it's incremental or it's transformative breakthrough, because when it's larger, the interest could also be uh, much more from the global uh, organization. Then what is the center's innovation priority and is it really aligned to the global uh, business priorities? the amount of resources and time that they have uh, that the center is able to get commitment on from the BU and HQ leadership and the level of the primary sponsor. So just to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, one of the key things that the strategic intent solves for is the center's ability to get participation from global leaders. As the center goes from uh, being like having innovation as a concept to innovation as a culture, it can drive high value transformative and breakthrough innovation, have autonomy over the local charter, as well as influence uh, the global innovation charter. And as a result, the interest from the highest levels of leadership in the organization increases. Now, what this does is it improves the innovation outcomes as well. As we can see broadly, there are three scenarios of sponsorship that one can have. One is that it is a local sponsorship. Second is that you have the local sponsorship, but you're also able to bring in um, the BU uh, or the functional leaders to sponsor part of the innovation process. And lastly, the best case scenario is that if you also have global buy-in and global sponsorship. So in case the charter has high value transformative and breakthrough innovation, then it is very important that there is BU and um, global support and sponsorship because without this, those uh, the high value innovation cannot really have a high likelihood of being deployed. 
Next pillar that we are coming to is really the process pillar, which assesses the center's ability to balance freedom and risk. So what do we look at here? One is the programs and their coverage across the life cycle stages that we discussed in the earlier part of the presentation. The next is uh, the existence of an innovation team that's actually going to manage the entire uh, innovation process and what the KRAs of this team are. The presence of mechanisms to bring in the customer perspective at different stages of the same innovation uh, life cycle. So um, we can see here on the slide that in the earlier stages of maturity, GCOE is mainly focused on ideation and not the entire life cycle from inception to implementation. Whereas the mature GCOEs have programs that are end to end with a very clear handoff to business and it becomes a very robust ecosystem. Next, we have seen that having a dedicated team that is linked directly to a global innovation um, responsible or team and works locally with a group of functional and technology leaders is highly effective. However, it's important to call out that this the structure on this slide is just a representation and it varies, bases the process and the structure both at the global and and uh, local organization as well as the ma innovation maturity at both these levels. The next pillar is really enablers. And while these are not very intuitive when we think about innovation management, they're very, very critical steps that uh, actually remove barriers to the employee's willingness and ability to focus on innovation at the center. So uh, these enablers are broadly bucketed into four areas. The first is the value proposition for an employee to pursue innovation at the center. And what is it that happens if an idea uh, or project fails? Second is the L uh, the focus of the L&D activities and how specific are they to innovation and what kind of tools and skill sets focused on innovation do they bring in? Second, uh, the next thing is the existence of uh, policies, HR policies or finance policies that actually help employees work on innovation. And lastly, is the use of data and infrastructure across the innovation lifecycle. So when we speak about value proposition, we need to look at it at two levels. First and very, very commonly used is the rewards and recognition system where innovation needs uh, to be considered. But secondly, also compensation and career acceleration for employees seriously pursuing innovation can be brought in. This kind of uh, value proposition, of course, needs to be structured around the stage, the amount the employee is contributing and the type of innovation being um, run from the center. So, for example, salary increments and bonuses work very well for breakthrough innovation. Uh, it's not something that, you know, you, we, we could do for incremental innovation. Uh, a case in point is an automotive GCOE where if employees uh, who ha are working on an internal startup reach a specific predetermined um, targets, they are, a they are entitled to one year's salary as a bonus. Now, looking uh, at L&D and understanding that a little bit, we've seen that the most effective uh, learning and development programs are linked to the innovation life cycle. For example, at the ideation stage, the L&D could be focused on validation exercises and um, the real world experimentation or business modeling is something that could be introduced at the problem solution fit stage. But of course, that is something uh, that comes with time. We, we see that initially the innovation training could be very ad hoc and self-initiated by the employee. Um, 
at the next stage is really where um, you know there's a lot of global programs that are um, that the local employees are benefiting from but only at stage 3 and stage 4 does it start getting a lot more targeted towards the needs of the local employees and uh, the stages that of innovation that they are working on but one thing to call out is that mature gcoe should um, you know look at focusing on building innovation smes uh, that can also guide other employees uh, in the center across specific innovation stages and that's where the site capability for innovation could really um, develop coming to the next and the last pillar the innovation metrics now uh, these are extremely important when we need to manage innovation outcomes as well as iterate or adapt a process uh, from time to time so the the first is really the input metrics where we're looking at the time and resources invested in innovation programs the second is what we call the pipeline metrics where we're looking at the health of the innovation pipeline and lastly we're looking at the outcome metrics where which is basically about the deployment and launch of innovations into the business so when we talk about in, uh, input metrics, it's basically the kind of time given by the employee, the leadership and the investment. Now, again, um, this changes per stage. So, um, you know, let, let's taking an example, we know that employees focus and resources at the problem solution fit stage is much higher than what is needed at the ideation phase. So for example, we know a financial services GCOE employees invest two to three days to demo their solution. And if that solution gets selected, then they're able to bring in the BU leadership and get sponsorship from them to actually pursue the idea. And that's the kind of system that's enabled. Now, moving on to pipeline metrics, uh, it is important to look at two things here. So first, it is important to measure the intensity and the conversion of ideas from one stage to another. So for example, we can look at the number of ideas at a particular stage, how many of these are really going to the next stage. Uh, next, it is very important to look at the impact of uh, the problem that you're solving for the solution uh, and what it's going to do for the business. So there could be various ways to do that. But again, taking an example, if you're looking at the same problem solution fit stage, one can look at the market validation. Is this a large enough problem that we are actually solving for? Uh, what is the impact of the solution that we are pursuing? Is this the, really the best solution? Uh, the neck and the, uh, is this also a viable solution for the business? And lastly, what is going to be the time to realize the benefit? If it is cost saving, how much time will I actually be able to get the cost saving in? Or if it's revenue, when can I actually hit that revenue? So now to summarize the framework and the key takeaways from the framework, I'd like to highlight five uh, first principles. So first is really that GCOEs need to start laying a strong emphasis on value creation and higher value creation if they need to start becoming more strategic partners in innovation. Second is that to drive this kind of value creation, there needs to be support sponsorship from the topmost level of the organization. And of course that comes gradually, but that's something that uh, one needs to work towards. Next, we have um, the portfolio approach. It's very important uh, to start taking the portfolio approach, having multiple bets, not getting fixated on one or few ideas. Uh, the fourth is the effectiveness of the process. So how, the way we need to look at the effectiveness of the process is really to look at the innovation output and the speed with which we are able to generate this output. Uh, and continuously improve on that. And lastly, very important is to enable the employees. So when we spoke about the enablers, we, we take out all of the barriers and we also manage the freedom and risk that we give. So now basis these five uh, first principles, we recommend four 
uh, key action steps for GCOEs. The first is really to build that common language around innovation so that one, you are, we, we talk a lot about uh, being able to measure innovation, but if you cannot name it, it's going to be very, very hard to measure it. So uh, you can name it, you can align the entire organization, top, bottom, everybody around it. And uh, that's, that's really uh, the benefit of the first action step. The second is uh, something that is simple but necessary, which is where you look at the entire process and you optimize your current innovation uh, program and reconfigure them um, with the current budgets that you have just to make sure that uh, they are effective uh, and they cover the entire life cycle. The next is... Um, is to build a business case. So now, you, now uh, once you've optimized, we're looking at identifying a globally relevant innovation area that uh, the center could work on and build a business case and get that support for the center. And lastly, is focus on uh, building a virtuous cycle for innovation and build that robust innovation portfolio. Um, so those are some of the key action steps that uh, you, you can start taking gradually and working towards. Before I conclude and we move on to the next uh, segment, we hope that the learning shared with you on this presentation the past 30 minutes have been helpful. And uh, if you think that there is something that needs to be addressed besides the points that we have touched upon so far, please share that with us either through the chat or um, and we'll try to address it in um, the rest of the segments, or we'll try and get back in touch with you post the webinar to discuss it. 